Well, I mean, the movement started in the 19th century. Um, the RSPCA was one of the first organizations. Uh, there were, interesting enough, uh, uh, that uh, Germany also had a strong animal protection movement, and Bismarck was a strong animal protectionist. And so Bismarck had established some laws on animal protection as well in, uh, at about the same time in, Ger in, in Germany as he was developing the German nation. Um, but um, the, in England in the 1820s, the uh, roots of the RSPCA took hold in London. And, um, and, and that sort of gradually grew, and Queen Victoria was an ardent animal protection advocate. And so she gave the RSPCA, agreed to be a patron of this new society. And that's why it's become the, it became the RS, Royal SPCA, um, whereas the National Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Children has always been the NSPCC. It's uh, been a bone of contention between the two operations for many years. Uh, because no royal ever gave them permission to use the royal um, uh, attribution, um, but the um, so the so the animal protection movement began in in, in England in the 1820s, um, spread to America in the 1860s. Um, the anti-vivisection movement really was an 1850s 1860s creation, and Frances Power Cobb was one of the sort of leading lights of that. She she came across the cutting up of animals, which in those days was done without anesthesia, um, in the 1850s in Florence, and was appalled by it. And, and there, there's, uh, uh, there's a, a deep-seated um, uh, uh, concern at, about this whole practice, which in those days, as I said, were done without anesthesia, was how could somebody claim to be a humanitarian and but generate knowledge by doing this sort of stuff, you know, cutting up animal, living animals to see where the nerves went and what happened if you did this or did that to the to the nerves and things of that nature. So there was a huge sort of um, uh, conflict, um, but with the public perception of the humanitarian doctor, which was um, exemplified in a play by Henry Salt. Henry Salt was uh, an Eton school teacher. Um, and he wrote a very important book in, the, in 1894 called Animal Rights, but he also wrote this little one-act play that uh, basically focused, it was all of the stereotypes of uh, the sort of anti-vivisection issue in that there was a woman with lots of money who was going to uh, give uh, Dr. Kirsterman, and the name is important, Kirsterman meaning cursed per individual, um, Dr. Kirsterman was going to, was trying to get money from her for his um, his clinic and his laboratory. And uh, Mrs. Good, Ms. Goodlightly or, or Goodheart was uh, Mrs. Kirsterman's lady-in-waiting and sort of a sort of companion, lady companion. And she was blew the whistle on Dr. Kirsterman. And Dr. Kirsterman had a brother who was, hunter, who was a hunter and so on and so forth and was very frank about his, his, ish, uh, his interests in hunting. And, and what it was, was that this was a play that designed to show that there was a hypocrisy associated with the whole animal research issue with, um, you know, Dr. Kirsterman sort of saying, I'm a humanitarian, I'm trying to save lives, I'm trying to improve medicine and so on and so forth, but then sort of doing nasty things to animals in the back room. And, um, of course, when the lady pa patron learned about this, she took the money away and... Uh, everything sort of fell apart. Um, but uh, th it's that conflict, that sort of conflict in image between the humanitarian research scientist versus the, the process by which the knowledge was gained that has always been at the root of this sort of uh, this fight over animal research. And it's still there. I mean, there's still, um, you can see it um, in, in the debate every day, um, this sort of concern about <coughs> You know, the public concern is, how can you do that? And the scientist says, well, I do it because I want to improve um, uh, our knowledge and understanding and improve medical care and so on. But there's still a, a, a difficulty. The, the general member of the public can, can never quite understand why it is that the scientist does it. And in fact, the scientists uh, have the same sort of deep-seated sense of concern and guilt uh, that... Uh, uh, about what they do, but they just uh, learn how to uh, learn how to sort of 
subordinate that to um, the greater good, shall we say. And so the, the, this is a conflict about this sort of thing. So you've got the scientists uh, having this underlying concerns themselves personally, but sort of suppressing it in order f and for the greater good and the public not understanding how people can do that necessarily. So it's, this, is, uh, this is what I learned uh, in those first few years at Frame because there was another very important book published in 1975 that few people have read um, uh, by a, uh, Ox another Oxford uh, D. Phil student. Um, uh, he wrote about uh, Victorian science and anti-vivisection, or science and anti-vivisection in Victorian England. And he articulated many of these sorts of issues. And they're as relevant today as they were back in the 1850s. Um, so uh, the anti-vivisection movement moved to America in the late 1800s. In 1894, there was a big fight over a bill before Congress that would have regulated research in, D in the District of Columbia in the same way as it was regulated in England. Um, and um, th it eventually failed because Johns Hopkins came out and defended the, the need for animal research. And, but it was, to give you a sense of what a big deal it was, six Supreme Court justices, all major religions, supported the bill. And the American Physiological Association, Johns Hopkins, and the other sort of major, major science, science, uh, scientific research figures opposed it. But I mean, it was, it was a hugely controversial issue in 1894. But by 1896, um, uh, the uh, controversy was going in the animal research way uh, because uh, the, the new developments in diphtheria, antitoxin, and things like that were beginning to show the benefits of animal research. <laughs>